All right, welcome into Honorado and Bagnardi. Uh, no baseball, although I did see highlights on Sports Center last night, Shawnee, of um, baseball being played by the Rakuten Monkeys, I believe they are. They won a wild game 10 8. So I did at least get a little bit of a baseball highlight fix, which was good. How are you, Bags? I'm doing okay. You know, it's uh, it's a different world. Yeah. Like these times, if you are healthy and you are still having some sort of income, then you're way ahead of a lot of people, unfortunately. So we're doing okay. We have nothing to complain about. Yeah, no. And and our guest, I said no baseball, but our guest is is John Shambi today. And, and this is awesome. Uh, it's great to have... And, and Boog, you put your name Boog in there. I feel weird calling you Boog, and I have a problem usually using nicknames when I don't know somebody. But are we cool on Boog terms We're cool. here? We're cool. I, it, at this point, I just I thought putting Boog in there would be best. I, I will confess that I don't normally introduce myself as yeah. Boog. I don't, it's, I don't feel like explaining the story. You either get it or you don't. But what I, I introduce myself as John always, and then everybody sort of in – you know, that I work with, they all call me Boog. So if you're new, you'll figure it out. Yeah, I was just going to say, we're not going to ask you to explain it. If you're a baseball fan, you get it. Uh, but I do, I'm curious, how many people in your life don't call you Boog? <laughs> so uh, I just had my 50th birthday was last weekend and uh, last Saturday. And I, I've had, I'm smiling because I've had this conversation because because everybody's quarantined, I mean, I, I didn't, the amount of response I got for my birthday was over the top. But there's a, there's this segmentation of, so there were a couple of girls who I grew up with who I've known since I was like seven and from seven to 13. And so I'm getting happy birthday, Jonathan. Uh, easy. Um, Mom will every once in a while refer to me as Jonathan. My grandparents called me Jonathan. Um, they're all passed away. Um, and then in high school, I was you high school and college, I was usually Shambi or Shams, like a shortening of my of my last name. And then I would say, Guys I grew up with who I'm still close with, I'm just John. And then right about 23 or later, I'm pretty much boog to everyone. Um, and that's kind of how it goes. Yeah. Well, I love it. I, I, and again, we're, I'm not going to ask you to explain more than that on, on the name. There is a story, though, that you're famous for. And I'm going to let you decide whether or not you want to tell it. I don't think Sean knows the story. We'll worry about that later. It obviously involves uh, Chipper Jones. Um, when's the last time you had a haircut? I don't know. It's terrible. I mean, it's just awful. It's like now I'll I'll confess. There's I didn't shower for you guys. Sorry. Um, <laughs> I didn't either. It's, it's it's just like I have it. Mine turn kind of goes light bulby, you know. So it's it's just it's a bad scene. It's I, like, and I'm actually pretty good seeing here. My my eyes. I wear glasses for distance, um, and I. But I honestly think now I wear the glasses sometimes to distract from the hair and the double chin. So it's like I got glasses on. People are like, "Oh, I kind of like those glasses. Those are kind of cool." And they're not paying attention what's happening up here. <laughs> Well, listen, I, you know what? Um, I think it's great as a fellow redhead, and you've still got it. So take that as a win, Sean. Yeah, Lee. I know. I, it, I, I'm, I'm getting some of the, like, Mr. Fantastic from the Fantastic Four on the side. Right. Um, I don't know. I, I, I'm, I frankly, I'm not – it's not I'm not vain, but I think I'm too lazy to consistently color that. So – so here we are. Yeah, yeah. I don't know, I, how long has it been? I uh, let's let me think about this. I would say it's probably been like seven weeks since a haircut. Okay. Yeah. That's impressive. Yeah. 
Chris spends four hours a day on his hair. So he's got good. You guys both got good hair. We're holding on for dear life, man. We're holding on for dear life. Ah. Um, all right. So, John, we don't have baseball um, and I'm dying, to be honest with you. And full disclosure here, I'm from New Jersey, northern Jersey, uh, grew up in the 90s watching the Braves on TBS. I'm a diehard Braves fan. Oh, wow. Shawnee, Shawnee's a big time Mets fan. So we okay. have a fun rivalry as we work together at the NBC yeah. affiliate in town. And man, I was, you know, look, I, I was afraid of what might happen in that division because it's so loaded, but I'm I'm missing baseball. Um, what do you make of the Arizona idea? So again, I, I think um, you know, I work with Jeff Pass, and he's the one that broke the story. It's not Jeff's responsibility in breaking stories to guard the story and see if they're prepared. Uh, to kind of defend it, I, I think. Um, I, I think right. It's just an idea right now. So like it came out, and all of the things that everybody's poking holes in are all things that they are going to sit there and say, "Yeah, we don't. We we're not entirely sure how it's it's going to work." So. My biggest concern is for the most vulnerable and the people kind of on the fringes, on the margins, as far as if you realistically are going to quarantine people and keep them away from their family, where are they staying? Who cleans the room? Does the person clean the room get quarantined or do they get to go back to their community? And if we're quarantining them, are we honestly going to pay somebody, you know, like paying someone ten dollars an hour and then making them stay away from their family for four and a half months doesn't seem especially fair to me. But letting them go back to their communities might not be safe. I, I think it's complicated. I don't think they have a a foolproof way to make this actually work. I, I do think this. It's it has to start with testing, right? I mean it because. And you can't give an entire sports league access to wide-scale testing if everybody outside my window here in New York City doesn't have access to it, if everybody in Detroit doesn't have access to it, if everybody in New Orleans doesn't have access to it. So there's a lot to be worked out. I think we're going to have some baseball this year, not a lot, but I think we'll have some. But what form it takes on, you know, that – so I'm a gas bag, long-winded. I, uh, but the, to, to cut to it, it's that, that came out. It's, it's totally in the idea stage. So, so many of the things are the answers to the questions, how do we do this, is I don't know. So it's going to take a while. Do you think that the league is better served having some kind of shortened season that looks nothing like what we're used to? or not having a season at all? Oh, I think play. I mean, if it's safe, I'd say play. I mean, I've advocated for – I would be down to try rule stuff, um, you know, whether it's pitch clock, shortening the games, and if we just do it the same, that's fine. But I'd also say I, I'm an advocate for – if it's 70 or under games – Man, let's roll out a 30-team knockout tournament in some form for the playoffs, and it'll be fine. We get too stuck in this, you know, how many games will it take for there to be a championship season or will it be a legitimate champion? Look, man, Bonds hit the most homers. That's what happened. And every time we mention his name – we have the discussion about what the suspicions are. The Astros won in 2017. You don't need to take the trophy away from them because we don't know who else did what. We're always going to bring up the trash can banging. And in the same way, you know, if the Mariners end up, or God forbid the Mets uh, end up winning, you know, the World Series in a 30-team knockout tourney, Everybody will remember, yeah, that year was different, and it'll be it'll be fine. It'll be fine. Yeah, I just feel like I'm not proud of that trophy, right, Chris? If you win that trophy, your Braves win a season that, you know, that's not a seven. Hey, let's, let's not make this personal. The Braves won World Series in the 90s, came on a shortened season. <laughs> yeah, 
I don't know what to tell you in terms of proud of that trophy. I, I don't I, I I can't help you with that one. It's not yeah. it, it's not about feeling proud of that trophy. And if you don't equate that to the one that they won in 86, that's your prerogative. But you're going to get the trophy and you're going to get rings and you'll be listed as the champion for that year. It'll just be different. John Shambi with us here. Uh, and uh, yeah, obviously, okay, we're, we're all dying for some kind of baseball this season um and and i'll take it with or without fans john uh i think i think i'm only gonna have one choice so i'll take it with or without fans but as a broadcaster what do you think about going into an empty stadium that would otherwise see you know fifty thousand people and there's nobody in the building but the players and i did do the marlins on the radio in 98 99 and 2000 <laughs> I've used that joke a lot, by the way. All right, can I? Can, let me ask you guys uh, before before we I, I I I get to that. I will answer that question. What will it be like without fans? But I guess can I just ask you this? If we didn't do what I suggested, how many games will it take for you to be proud of the trophy? Oh, 110? 120? 90? I'm good. I'm good with anything over half. I'm good. I love your idea of like a tournament. That would be fun. Absolutely. Yeah, I'm with you. It would, it would be it would be fun to see. I don't know if I feel as happy about winning a tournament as I would a full playoffs. I think the regular season you can give me a lot fewer games. I, maybe in that half range, somewhere in there. As long as the playoffs are legit. Then I think I would I would feel like I'd be proud putting that. Yeah. Show. Yeah. All right, we're gonna we need to have more conversations. You gotta shake that loose. You gotta let go. You gotta let go. Uh, no. So as far as doing games with no fans in the stands, you know, for the beginning, I, my guess would be it'll be fine, and then it'll stink mm -hmm. because you're just used to. That jolt, that energy, the you know from from the crowd, and I've had players and managers say to me, "Man, once you get into week three of play, that is going to be tough." I mean, if you guys have been to spring training, you know, and go fire up a B game on the backfield when you know Freddie Freeman's leading off every inning and no one's there, it, it's. I mean, it, it's like a vacuum. Just it just sucks all the energy. There's none. Yeah. Um, but if that's what it takes, that's what it takes. I'd also say I make this point. Um, I, I hope that if we get there, look, if there are no fans in the stands, we get a chance to do some of those all access games, and they were good. You need more of that. You need more of that connection. And and again. It's, it's not just competition, it's entertainment. So you'd be playing these games on TV. Mm -hmm. I and mean, I know that all the games are played on TV, but with no fans in the stands, you'd be playing the games on TV. Like the idea of thinking about how to execute playing games, it needs to be thought of, in my opinion, as you know the competition and putting it on television every game that's that's important because that's that's what the audience is freeman rounded the bases in that spring training game while he was mic'd up was just absolutely cool. oh my gosh yeah it was great i had the cubs game with brian and rizzo and they were sensational yeah that was really good really good um all right i'm, I'm curious boog without baseball and sean and i were talking about this a little bit the other day um are the Astros the unexpectedly biggest beneficiary of all this? Like, I haven't talked about the Astros in a long time now. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I think uh, because we're going to be so starved for baseball and for competition that it's just – I just – whatever the volume uh, towards the Astros, I think it will be less now. That's, mm. That would be my that would be my thought. So, yeah, I mean, look, I 
And I understand it's funny. I've thought about from a language standpoint, how do you actually frame it? You know, I mean, a, a global pandemic and the beneficiary is the Houston Astros. I, I know what you're saying, but it's uh, yeah, I, I do think that it's it's turned uh and, and and I'd also make the point and benefits the Astros and it benefits baseball. Like you want this to go away. The league does, you know, I mean, to, you want it to go away from covering it is what, you know, at a certain point, because it's all anybody been talking about. And now, you know, we're starving for talking about just competition and, and the sport in its real sense. Do you think the approach from other teams toward the Astros will be different now, whereas we may have seen, you know, guys get beamed? If this eh, is that got overstated. I, I think that I, there was not going to be any trend. I think that you were going to see – you'd see some stuff here and there. You'd see somebody hit somebody and start something. Was that going to be a consistent thing? Not in my opinion, it wasn't. But you're still going to see, once we get settled back in, yeah, someone's going to stick one in Alex Bregman's pocket probably just because they're going to be like, yeah, we remember that or whatever, right? So I think that was always overstated. And I will say that one, you know, one of the problems that they were looking at was this idea that you know, again, the Players Association allowed the players to go in and talk in exchange for the fact that they were granted immunity. And it still probably is going to happen. Someone's going to hit an Astros player. They won't ever admit that this is why, but for some type of retribution, and that guy's going to get suspended, and the Astros player won't have been suspended. And that there's a certain irony to that. <laughs> yeah, there sure is. Uh, all right, Boog, if the Astros are in a weird way a beneficiary here, if we don't have baseball at all this season, in your opinion, what's the one team that really missed an opportunity? Um, I don't think that's going to happen. I, okay. I, I would, and, th and this is my – I think that the other sports are going to have trouble sorting – stuff out. I think at a certain point, whatever the number ends up being, I think there's going to be pressure on baseball, but then also the opportunity for baseball to have a moment. Um, and that's part of why I think I, I'm not saying they're going to risk help, but I, why I think they're really going to try and figure out a way, but you know, baseball to stand apart, like for all the people that have drifted away from baseball and the popularity is certainly, it's still an unbelievable business. I make this point all the time. Last year, baseball made $2 billion with a B more than the NBA. Now, I think the NBA is probably more popular, right. but baseball's trending in a not so great direction. Um, so I, I think that, um, I think that for baseball, to, to have the stage all to itself. I mean, at this point, for as NFL crazy and college football crazy as our network is and as we are as a country, I mean, I think if you put the Royals and the Indians on tomorrow night for real, it'd get like a 30, you know? Yeah. As far as teams, you know, to have an opportunity, I mean, you, you want to say the Dodgers because of the Mookie thing, but – I, A, think the Dodgers will still be actively involved in trying to re-sign Mookie. And then, B, even if they don't get the Dodgers are going to be great again next year. So I don't know that there is – it's part of the problem in the sport right now in that um, we're getting back to a place where you know who the teams are. We're getting back to the place where – you know, we had that, but we're getting back to the place where – yeah, the, the, they don't play this year. Guess what? The Yankees and the Dodgers are going to have a really good chance to win again next season. Um, so I, I don't think that there's a single one single team that will, like, in my opinion, that would miss their chance in this one particular year. 
I got a weird pandemic question for yeah. you. Yeah. Would you rather would you rather watch a classic baseball game that you've seen and yeah. know the outcome or a simulated baseball game? Oh boy. Um I I don't it's we I don't know I can't really explain this because like I'm s I, I wish if you saw my office, it's just I it's just scorecards. Like I have all my scorecards everywhere and I'm just going through them and and clipping notes and that type of thing. But I I guess I it's my way of saying I'll go see and neither. I ha I've watched pieces of the classic games. I haven't sat through – I watched a little bit of the 97 game seven. I watched some of the Gibson game the other night. I, you know, he, here and there, I think Tuesday we're doing the uh, game five 95 division series when uh, Edgar Martinez and the Mariners beat the Yankees. Um, so I've been watching a little bit here and there. Sim thing is not my thing, but if someone who had a better idea about that, I, I might be interested. So I, I think, uh, I need an editor, huh? Uh, I, I would say watch the classic game, but not in any significant way. Well, you'll find this kind of, you know, just, uh, maybe coincidental. I've managed to watch game six in, in the 95 World Series. I've found a way to watch game seven in the 92 NLCS. Right. Uh, but game seven in 91, no thanks. Yeah. Been there, saw it, painful. Yeah. Um, right. They, they played, my God, somebody, I think it was MLB Network, played that awful Jim Lairitz game in the 96 oh. World Series. I just, you know, so yeah. to Sean's point, like, I guess if I know the outcome and I don't like the outcome, give me a simulated yeah. game. I don't know. <laughs> right. I, 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 that's, that's funny. I would say emotionally. Right. So the Red Sox fans are probably not watching game six of the 86 World Series. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, yeah. Uh, what are you watching? First, behind the bag. It gets from Buckner. Here comes Knight and the Mets win it. Sorry. What are you watching that isn't baseball or sports at all? I don't even know what I've been doing. I'm drinking a lot of coffee. Uh, I'm reading. Uh, I just got uh, Swing Kings. Where is oh, it? Yeah. I just got Swing Kings. So I'm about to dig into that. Um, Mike Breen. I'm, is that uh, – am I name dropping? So, I mean, whatever. I know – Brini, I uh, and he, I was teasing him because he's older. He's not that much older than me, but I was like, "What are you watching, Gramps?" He's gonna be mad now if he sees this. <laughs> he made me change it to Uncle Mike, but he, uh, he's like, "You could really watch Band of Brothers." It's an old age group, and I watched it, and I was, I was, I would, te I was texting him. He was like nagging me if you started watching it. And then after the first one, I was like, I'm watching. And then by the third episode, I was like, Uncle Mike, I'm in. This is awesome. So that's probably been my favorite thing I've been into. I I, I looked, I checked out Love is Blind for three episodes in like 40 minutes. And I tapped out. I don't know whether you guys got the press release that I tapped out, but I sent that out to everybody. Um, what else have I watched? I watched uh, I watched a Netflix. Len Casper is my buddy who's uh, with the Cub. We talk all the time. He's good at finding interesting stuff. I watched a documentary on the Navarro Junior College cheerleading team. A series on that called Cheer. Oh yeah, okay. Good, good, good show. Uh, re you know, it's reality stuff. Um, what else? My little, here's one I'm really happy with. I have a younger brother who's 30, and he's watching Cheers for the first time. And it's such a delight to me. I think that I love Cheers, and I know it's a little bit old person-y, but it holds up, man, and it's funny and clever. And my brother's got a great laugh. He's an awesome dude. 
So Benny will just send me texts like along the way with different episodes. So that's been that's been kind of fun. I'm struggling through the third season of Ozark right now. Um, I'm in the city until it gets dark and rainy. So and you know, there's some anxiety. I mean, legit in terms of going outside. And so, you know, it depends, but I, I struggle a little bit with stuff that's dark, man. I can't, you know, so, so, I, you know, Ozark is good. I like it, but just every once in a while, it's like, Ruth, stop yelling, stop cursing. Somebody fire up a smile for me. Enough already. So, have you given Shit's Creek a try? You know what? So, I have not, and that's that's like right, right, yeah. uh, right there at the top of the list. Yeah, that's yeah. the list over there, right? What, right what there. about Tiger King? Tiger King, I watched. I didn't love it, and 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 I'm I was in the I know I was in the minority on that, but like I just didn't. I, I no, there was nobody likable, man. At a certain point, it was weird and. I just, uh, I didn't, I didn't like anybody in it. So I got through it. It was fine, but it didn't wow me. I didn't even try it, and I won't. Honestly, I, I've heard enough. I'm like, you know what? I'm, I'm good. There's enough drama. Like There's good tone you used there, Chris. It was judgy. It was a little finger waggy. I'm right there. We can hang out. It's fine. <laughs> yeah, I'd rather cast aspersions than look inward. You know what I mean? Yeah, that's, that's what, I mean. Hey, we're all stuck inside. It's a good time to oh. just get, get judgy and absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Boo, back to baseball, man. Um, who is a guy that, you know, I know you mentioned Mookie and a lot of people in New York and I think Aaron Judge and and uh, Pete Alonso, Shawnee would jump on. But it, but outside of the Sotos and Acunas and, and the real stars of the league, and I haven't even mentioned Trout yet, who's a guy that you really enjoy watching? Yelich. I think Yelich, I think if you're asking the question, the best player is Trout. Mm -hmm. But I think, but I think legitimately now, because it's gone on for a while, I think the, if the question is who's the best hitter in the sport, there are two answers and you can say, okay, and it's Trout or Yelich. Yelich is, Yelich's ability to barrel up the ball. And statistically that's, it's certainly the case. He's a really good base runner, but Yelich, I, I'm just I'm amazed at his. To me, his at bats are, are must watch, and I the transformation is is pretty incredible. So he he's a guy for me that I that I really enjoy. But I you know I love the greatness. I I you know Mookie. I've done so many Red Sox games. As a person, I really enjoy him as a defender, as a hitter. I like talking to J.D. Martinez about hitting because you know, Ian Kinsler, who just retired, but he 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 dubbed him just to me, but I think it's perfect, especially in light of the conversations that I've had with J.D., but he, he dubbed him the mad scientist, and that's what J.D. is like. I mean – JD's the first guy a few years ago that I saw. He would he tapes batting practice, like swings on the side, batting practice against the guy throwing 60 miles an hour. And then he's going inside looking at the swings. Um, and when he started doing that, he was the only guy that did it. And then everybody on the Red Sox started doing it. And now most teams do it. So it's it's uh it's interesting, but as uh, with all my other answers, uh, yeah, Yelich was my was my initial answer. Final answer. Yeah, had a lot of coffee today, guys. I'm sorry. Keeping keeping in mind that I'd like you to say Degrom. Uh, who's the best pitcher in baseball? Degrom. Yeah. All right. He's awesome. Thanks. That dude. That dude is. Oh my gosh. I mean, they don't score for him, but he's so good. And, you know, a great example of why wins and losses are a silly way to evaluate a pitcher. I mean, look, Scherzer's been incredible over an extended period, but 
DeGrom has turned into, I mean, as elite as it gets. And I love watching him. I love the mentality. Um, I'm, I'm a huge Jacob DeGrom fan. You know, I made this point. So, like, I made this point a couple years ago. This is just old-fashioned, you know, baseball talk. I, like, I like analytics, right? So, I, you know, the way they, they do stuff, um, and I can't wait to see Sean's face change when I say this. Um, <laughs> but they're constantly comparing dollars for value and where you are in terms of um, – Service time. So a guy like Labor Torres, not last year, but the year before, was so valuable. He's, I mean, last year he was too, but the year before, you know, a zero service time guy effectively. And, um, and one of my big things was if I'm the Yankees, I would trade Labor Torres for Jacob DeGrom in two seconds because. When you're the Yankees, you're at this play. They're not trying to make the playoffs. The Yankees are trying to win the World Series. Like the equipment, the, it's so. And the same thing for the Dodgers. Every other team's trying to make the postseason. The Yankees are trying to figure out how to win the postseason. And to me, even if you're not going to sign Degrom, if you go back to then and you didn't know there was going to be a pandemic, um, you're talking about trading Glaber Torres. For three years of Jacob Degrom's postseasons, I'd have done that in a heartbeat. Um, because Degrom, I think, I think, would have a greater impact on your ability to win in the playoffs. I love Jacob Degrom. I think he's he's a monster. Boog, uh, we all do interviews for a, a living here, the three of us. Um, but I would be uh, straight up like terrified to interview certain sports people like I, I i would like the challenge of it but man popovich would scare the you know what out of me absolutely like in between the third and fourth quarter go back to when maybe you were breaking into the business was there is there one moment where you were just nervous to do an interview okay so i got a couple of things for you on that i i keep forgetting to ask this but can we curse on this uh, sure, go for it. Okay. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> okay. So my first thing, I love Greg Popovich. I do think that my I have a good my buddy George Sedano from back in Miami has actually gotten Pop to smile. He's gotten him to crack a little bit, which I love. I personally think that act is tired. I don't like just be nice to people. Mm -hmm. it's, and I know that he's smart and awesome. I know too many people that love him. I know he's a good dude. I just, I don't dig on that. I don't, just be a little nicer, man. I'm not like, I'm not, I'm not good with it. All right. So, um, so, uh, my, uh, my first year with the Marlins, one of the things that was so great, my first year with the Marlins was 97. And my job was to do the pre- and post-game interviews. But pre-game, I would interview everybody. Mm -hmm. And I was a moron, so I tried to get everybody. So the, you're, the Marlins are playing the Giants? Hey, where's Barry Bonds? You know, <laughs> the Marlins are playing the Astros? Where's Jeff Bagwell? Roger Clinton, so on and so forth. So I had, I had a chance um, – and I interviewed Bonds probably twice, and he was sensational. And I also had him demolish me. I, so one of the times was, it was 97, 98, 99-ish, one of those times. And he's in the clubhouse, and I'm standing in the clubhouse, uh, the guy who runs a clubhouse, a visiting clubhouse, um, in his office, like in the doorway. And Barry is walking slowly towards the food room. And he walks past, he's walking past me like so slowly. And I go, uh, excuse me, Barry, uh, John Shelby, Marlins Radio. I was wondering, would you have uh, five minutes to do the pregame with us? Would that be okay? <laughs> and he's walking and this is the way it looks. He's just like this and he just goes, 
Hell f- no. <laughs> and then keeps going. But I'm not good with, like, that's not the end of the exchange for me. Like, I'm like, I, I need to. So now <laughs> he goes into the food room. Now he comes back. And I'm like, Barry, you sure? I'm like, they, you know, people want to hear from you. And he stops and he goes, let me ask you a question. Are you getting paid for this interview? And I'm like, yeah, 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 I'm getting paid for this interview. And he goes, Am I gonna get paid for this interview? No, we're not we're not gonna we're not gonna pay. He goes, that's what I'm talking about. And then he just walked away. Boy, I think he monetarily did okay for himself. Yeah, he did fine. It was just one of those, <laughs> it's just one of those, one of those things. But I, and I mean like the, and I should say this is happening, and the clubhouse has stopped. Mm-hmm. But and then there were just other times, you know, he didn't see me enough, so he probably didn't remember me. But where I'd be like, he'd be at his locker, Barry, you got a couple minutes, and yeah, sure, no problem. Yeah. Um, but they, it was a great way to get information, to get to know guys, and you do it every year. And I used it, you know, I mentioned Jeff Bagwell. Bagwell, Biggio, those guys were so good to me every year. And so it got to the point you're five years in the league, and every year you're interviewing them once or twice. They start to know who you are, and then it becomes a thing where you're doing play-by-play, and as they see you, and now they'll react, and they'll, you know, you'll get to ask them questions. I mean, it's, it's you know, I have the good rapport with Chipper, but so – that's how my relationship started with Chipper and with John and with Greg Maddox and Tommy Glavin is I would go, you know, the Marlins would play the Braves all the time. You'd go see those guys. I'd probably interview each of them twice a year starting in 97, and then it becomes a thing. It was so valuable for me, it, you know, getting FaceTime. Am I really doing the John Cena? Uh, FaceTime with, uh, with those guys – and it just it allowed me to establish a connection and a way, you know, to get yeah to get stuff from guys, to get stories, and and be able to tell things and humanize them and ask questions. It was great, but I, yeah, I got punched in the face more than a few times. Because you led us there, Shawnee. Let me jump in here. Because you led us there, I'm going to ask you. You're probably like. Any ridiculously successful band solo artist who is tired of playing a certain song every time they do a concert, but they know they have to play it because it's a crowd favorite. Wow. So I'm going to leave it up to you. And you were, you, you know, were, hang you, on. Do you know a story with Chipper? Yeah. you. I mean, you are setting, I mean, I'm a band. I'm Yeah. So like I'm Pearl Jam, but I, I'm tired of playing a live. Yeah, it feels yeah. A little, it's a little over the top. That is a kind compliment. <laughs> um, Beg, you know this story? No, Sean, you know no, this story? I heard no. Okay, so do you want to tell it, Boo? Yeah, sure. All right. So Chipper, I did the Braves in seven, eight, and nine on television, and Chipper was incredible in terms of. I was a look. I was an analytics guy, but I'm a broadcaster. I like to. I, I would read Bill James and fan graphs and all that stuff, but I also Baseball people just taught me so much, and it was great. I could take information and go to Chipper, and I said, Chipper, it's like putting coins in a machine. So one day, I think it was 09, and we're in San Diego. The Braves are playing the Padres, and Chipper hadn't been swinging the bat very well. And I went up to him, and I said, how come you're swinging to the first pitch so much? And he said, well – you know, it's it's probably the only time I'm going to get a fastball in the entire plate appearance. And I said, okay, well, I looked on fan graphs. Do you know you see the second fewest first pitch strikes in baseball? And he was surprised. He was like, really? And now some of the other guys are standing there, and they're like, yeah, you're Chipper Jones. That's not surprising. So, but we keep going back. He's like, yeah, but he's like, I'm looking for a fastball to hit to drive. That's what I'm trying to do. The first pitch is where I'm going to get it. So we kind of wrestled a little bit, and then we kind of had to break up the conversation because they had to go hit. So I go up to the booth. That's where the booth is. It's up there. And uh, game starts. 
And first two guys uh, make out. And Chipper comes to the plate. Tim Stoffer's on the mound, former first-round pick, but had arm issues, didn't throw particularly hard. Quick interruption, yeah. Boo. What's that? Quick interruption. Stoffer is from our area, Saratoga. That's right. That's yeah. right. Yeah. Um, and did he go to Richmond or Wake Forest? One of those. But, yeah, yeah. So, anyway, whatever. So, first pitch, Chipper's up there, right down the middle, and he takes it. And it's a fastball at 91. And he steps out. <laughs> And then just looks at me and then digs back into the box, shakes his head. He ends up walking and we're howling, laughing. Joseph and I are laughing. And I told the story plenty of times. And I, somebody had gotten a screenshot for me. It's actually Ryan Cortez, Parakeet Cortez gave me this screenshot years ago. Um, he works on Levitard show and on highly questionable and so forth now. But uh, last year, Chipper was in the booth and I told my producer to find the clip. So I found the game or they found the game. I told him what game it was. Well, he comes in and I swear to you, I had never, not never, but I didn't talk to Chipper about it. And in the middle of the game, he's like, now what was that game in San Diego? And I was like, all right, here we go. And we played the whole clip and showed the whole thing. And it was, it was, it was pretty awesome. It was pretty awesome. But to have him in the middle of the game be like, seriously? Seriously? Um, it was it was pretty good. It was well, Gla Glavin's my boy. He Tom Glavin is the reason I'm a Braves fan, but Chipper Jones in a broadcast booth is gold. Absolute gold. Yeah, he'll be fun. And, I mean, all those guys were so good to me. And they're fun and funny. And they don't take themselves too seriously, whether it's, you know, Maddox or Glavin or, or Smoltz. Uh, just great. Just great. And uh, and Chipper, I say it, Chipper's a savant. And, and I think we're going to – we'll we'll make good broadcasting, I think. I hope. Shawnee, you good, brother? Yeah. All right, Boog. Sorry, before I was breaking up. Let you go because we've used up a lot of your Saturday already. Yeah, um, I got a lot to do. There's a lot, a lot on the docket today. So go ahead. Um, I know this is a cause near and dear to your heart, and yeah. um, I've had the opportunity, the pleasure, and, and quite frankly, I'm honored to. Uh, be part of our area's ALS Regional Center golf outing for the past few years now. It's St. Peter's Health Partners. They have an ALS center. Um, you're a Boston College guy. Pete yeah. Frades did as much for the awareness of, of this disease as, as probably anybody. Yeah. Um, tell us why this is such an important cause for you. I know you're heavily involved in raising funds and awareness for ALS. Yeah, so for me, it's... Uh it's yeah, it's personal. I, I, um, I grew up in New York city on Roosevelt Island and my buddy, Tim Sheehy, that's him right there. Um, he's a graffiti artist. Um, and we, you know, he, he and I met when we were seven years old. And, um, so Tim was diagnosed with ALS in 2005 and he passed in 2007, but before he died in 2006, we we helped put together a 501c3 and started a charity to help. I mean, I'm in on, I'll help. I, ALS, I want them to find a cure, um, but the people that are living with it are just crushed financially. So, so we started a charity um, where Tim helped develop the charter. It's called Project Main Street. And we usually do a big event at the end of May, which we unfortunately have had to postpone. It's a gala and then with an auction and also a softball event that we play on the field we grew up playing on. And we raise money and every dollar goes to someone living with ALS because, you know, in times like these, you know, whether it's a hospital bed, whether it's paying your insurance, whether it's 
um, a you know reconstructing some part of your house to become more wheelchair accessible technology we partner with team gleason as well you know eye gaze machines all of that so it's basically helping the living um those that that have als which is an area that you know until the last few years had been really underfunded as much as people have been throwing money at you know finding a cure healthcare like i said the cost is so prohibitive it's ridiculous the amount of stuff that isn't covered so you know, again, I, I, I would love for baseball to have uh, a Lou Gehrig day that would be an ALS awareness day. Um, you know, not asking the teams to to raise money, but if you know you have the blue for the Father's Day, the pink for Mother's Day, and cancer. But I think you know everybody knows Lou Gehrig. He's one of the greatest, most famous players of all time. I feel like it's baseball's disease. I I just would really like to see the sport. You know take up the mantle and, and help drive awareness. Look, you know, you not, I feel stupid comparing to diseases, but I've, I've used this before. ALS is fatal hundred percent of the time. And there aren't too many of any, even, you know, the most severe form of cancer, it's not fatal a hundred percent of the time. ALS is going to get you. Um, I just, you know, again, it's personal. I miss Tim. We get to do, uh, these events, we have our one big event, but then other smaller events. And uh, yeah, projectmainstreet.org is our site if you want to help. Um, and that's a, something that's, you know, driven me in terms of staying connected with guys. There are plenty of patients out there, guys like, um, you know, Pat Quinn and Chris Combs, um, who, you know, watch all the time. They're big sports fans. And you know, just try and pick their spirits up and just try and help. That's all. That's really the the thing. And it's a, a chance for me to, to think about Tim and think about Tim with a smile and doing something in his honor. So, yeah, well, listen, you're, you're doing it. Uh, anybody who who follows you on social media uh, knows how heavily involved you are uh, raising awareness and funds for ALS. Listen, Boog, we can't tell you how much we appreciate the time, man. I know you've been on a thousand podcasts in the last month. You agreed to do this one. Uh, why, I'm not sure, but I'm glad you did, man. Thank you. My pleasure. Chris, Sean, thank you guys so much. Uh, it was fun. And uh, stay safe, and we'll talk again soon. You too. The great Boog Shami. You too. Thank you. With us here. thank you, brother. Shawnee, how about that, man? What a dude. No, it was good stuff. Uh, yeah, no, that was good, especially at the end there. You know, and it's funny when he said that at the end in baseball so um certainly a good cause and that was that was fun uh, he he had a lot of great stuff to say for sure yeah you know you know how you and i both feel this way sometimes when there's like nothing to talk about in the world of sports is when you get the best conversations right exactly sometimes you know we, we always say we're, we're so we can't get anything done <laughs> and now it's funny because nobody really i mean there are a lot of people who are very busy certainly the ones dealing with this pandemic but there are unfortunately too many people who aren't very busy but it's interesting to see all the all of the good stuff that can come out of that as well yeah yeah all right buddy uh later this week we'll catch up with uh ryan rucco from espn was busy over the weekend with the wnba draft uh his nba season of course was thrown into a, uh, it feels like almost a permanent pause of some sort. Um, and obviously the Yankees season never got started for him. So we'll, uh, we'll catch up with, uh, with Ryan Rucco, man. Bags have a uh, hang in there over there, right? The social distancing, nothing better has happened to this podcast than social distancing. I love it. All right, man. Sounds good. All right, Shawnee. We'll see you, bud. Thanks for hanging out, everybody, here on Honorado and Bagnardi. We're on Facebook. We're on Twitter. We're on YouTube. Check us out there.